Ladies and gentlemen, um, Minister, speakers, uh, staff um, of the Heartbeat Trust and the St Vincent's uh, Blood Pressure Unit and Heart Failure Units, you're very welcome to the second in a series of public meetings that we've had on the St Vincent's Screening to Prevent Heart Failure Programme, the Stop HF Programme. This programme is now in its uh, ninth year and in the first we'll say research phase of the program, it's demonstrated some really, really impressive benefits, um, uh, both healthcare and also health economic benefits for the country and for the people involved. And Professor Ken MacDonald tonight will give you some more details and the good news from that program. Now it's in what we call a clinical service phase. So for the last year and a half, we've been running this program, not stopping it, but as a clinical service. And we've been broadening out the group of people that are involved in the program. And there are now more than 1,800 people, nearly 1,900 people involved in the Stop HF program. Um, and in particular, in the past year and a half, we've uh, recruited people with diabetes. And in fact, many of the people here tonight uh, are living with diabetes and living well with diabetes. And we're very lucky to have Professor Donal O'Shea here tonight to talk. Donal is an endocrinologist. Some of you will know him well. He will talk about how caring for diabetes is also about caring for the heart because cardiovascular uh, care in diabetes is really, really important. It's a great pleasure for me to um, just say a few words at the outset of this um, Heartbeat Trust screening to prevent heart failure, Stop HF, second public meeting. Um, I was pleased to attend your first uh, such public meeting uh, in September, I think it was, in Dunleary, um, which was a terrific event, um, very stimulating, um, insightful evening for me as a minister, and I'm quite sure that this evening um, will be uh, just as interesting, and I'm delighted to, that you uh, saw fit to invite me back uh, a second time. The meeting provides a, an important forum for debate, I suppose, first of all, on the issues that face uh, health professionals and individual citizens uh, in the fight to reduce the incidence of heart failure. It also provides, it seems to me, an excellent opportunity to discuss and to focus in more detail on chronic disease management, and in particular, uh, diabetes, which is the focus uh, this evening. The fundamental responsibility for healthcare is with, with ourselves, with me, with you, to look after ourselves. Obviously, to be provided with the wherewithal to do it. And I think the fact that there's such a large crowd here this evening and at the previous Stop HF meeting speaks to the fact that, at least to us here in this room, we're probably converted to that idea. And we need to convert more and more people in the country to take individual responsibility uh, to healthcare. The second uh, quick thank you, the first obviously was to all of you for showing up, is to the Heartbeat Trust. Now this is like thanking your own family, <clears throat> which is, I don't know, in some circles may even appear to be a bit rude, but I've got to thank, first of all, the four ladies in the front here for doing all the hard organisation. This event would not have happened uh, without the hard work of the people in the Heartbeat Trust, and that was done by the, the people on the ground. And also to the organisation itself, which tries to deliver what's on the slide here. It's, it's a, a novel approach to healthcare. Uh, not, it's focusing in on the heart, but obviously strays outside into areas that are involved with the heart, such as diabetes. And we're trying to evolve new strategies of care where we can bed down care, as Mark was saying, in the community and not be reliant on, on hospital care. Hospitals should be used for when they are needed, but we should have the majority of care, if possible, in the community. And the Heartbeat Trust is also in the business of trying to develop and roll out uh, and seed new services to this end. <clears throat> At meetings like this, you sometimes get the sense, if you're, if you're half listening, that there's a, an undercurrent of criticism of what's going on at the moment. And let me say at the outset that our health service provides very good service in certain areas. Where the, pre where the system works at present is the, worst so the once off encounter, <coughs> the trauma, the surgery, and even in some phases of prevention like inoculation and vaccination. I mean, we do very well there, and we hit all the metrics and international standards. So we should be proud of our health service in that regard. And I think, as the minister says, 
We all have a challenge, not just Ireland, but internationally we have a challenge with chronic disease. So where we are poor in our healthcare delivery, they are poor in North America, they are poor in the UK, they are poor in France, they are poor in the Western world in general. We all have this challenge of how to deliver care for the chronic illness, for the extended care and for the multi-level care. And by multi-level I mean care in the home, with the general practitioner in the community and with the specialist services. That all has to link and I don't think we're particularly good at that and that's one of the things that the Heartbeat Trust is trying to get at and improve. And fundamental in chronic disease management, and again, the Minister has given you the figures there about the, uh, the avalanche of chronic disease, and I think it's 75% of the cost of healthcare in the European Union is spent on the management of chronic illness. So it's an extraordinarily, part, extraordinarily high part of the budget of healthcare in the, in, in the European Union. So part, of the, part and parcel of chronic disease management is prevention. If we can prevent chronic disease or delay its onset, well, it's obviously better for us all as individuals, and it's also better for those that have to look after the payment of healthcare. Now, in terms of prevention and focusing in on cardiovascular disease, and specifically in heart failure, listed there are the issues that we have to worry about in terms of trying to prevent these, what we call, risk factors from developing into full-blown heart disease and heart failure in particular. And I put in bold there diabetes because it is the focus of tonight's meeting, but it's... it's um, all of these risk factors as listed there need to be attended to to try and focus <laughs> in on prevention and delay the onset of cardiovascular disease. And in that regard, again, as Mark was saying at the outset, the Stop HF project and its conception is the, the work of several individuals, some of whom aren't even in the room here tonight because it's a project born in 2004, is, a, is a certainly a novel, I always hesitate to use the word unique, but it's certainly a leading effort internationally and try to develop prevention in cardiovascular disease to make our lives more independent of hospital and to try and allow us to live more comfortably in the community until that day that we're going on to do a next planet wherever that is. So that's what the Stop HF study was designed to do. And in particular we were keen to have a good representation of patients with diabetes. And I'm delighted to have Donald here tonight because we've been collaborating with our diabetic services in Lockmanstown, in St. Michael's and St. Vincent's, which are already working together at hospital level in this region. Because patients with diabetes do have an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease, and, and Donald may touch on this, and particularly of an increased risk of developing heart failure. And I'm not going to get into the basic science of this, but there are a couple of reasons. One is that diabetic people are more prone to have high blood pressure than some of the other risk factors. And also there's an independent insult, if I can use that word, from diabetes onto the heart. And that's why we want to focus on that. Now that's not something we, we, can, we can't beat. We can beat that and it may come up in discussion later on how some of the more recent evidence from our unit would suggest that the better care that's given to diabetics in the region that we're working in has resulted in an improvement in heart function relative to what we're seeing internationally. Now this is a, an interesting slide, and I, I'm putting it up simply to show what happens with chronic illness. I wouldn't, if I were you, try to put yourself anywhere on this slope. Uh, I was looking at this earlier on and saying, where am I on this slope? And if you're under 40, I really apologize for not including you on this slope, but uh, under 40 doesn't really register for chronic disease usually. Uh, so most of us in this room, sorry ladies, no, you're not in this, you're, you're below 40, aren't you? Most of us in this room are probably in this transit, and you know, those of you that are up around 80, I'm not saying you have to uh, check out now, okay? Uh, <laughs> life goes on, and uh, I mean, most people do very well. But uh, what the point I'm trying to get across is that when you're in that area, just above 50, 60, when you're developing risk factors, and you still have a relatively good quality of life, that's when we want to start focusing in on prevention, to prevent that downslope in quality of life as you get to the latter years. And that can be done. There isn't an inevitability about the fact that overwhelming morbidity has to accompany the latter years of life. That can be altered, and the work that's been done in the St. Vincent's Heart Failure Unit with the Heartbeat Trust has shown that even in that latter phase, that curve can be moved upwards. But the focus of tonight is in on that middle phase of the graph where people are developing risk factors such as diabetes and high blood pressure. And we're trying to get that population to try stay level. And we're all focused on patient quality of life and how well we're getting on as individuals, but 
They're also a group looking over our shoulders, uh, and we're also looking at this, looking at costs. And you look at the red line there of cost of healthcare, and we've all got a responsibility to try and keep that cost down without compromising quality of life or safety of life. And you can see where the costs escalate. And that, again, can be approached. That, again, can be knocked down by us giving better chronic disease care in the community. So what the Stop HF did as a research project, and what it's now doing as a clinical service, is using a blood test that you've all become familiar with. It's called natriuretic peptide, NP. We use a form that we call BNP. And that's a protein made by our heart that tells us an early warning signal that tells us things are going just a little bit awry. It comes on the radar before any symptoms of any illness comes on the radar. And it's been shown not only by us, but people around the world to be a very powerful indicator of emerging heart or blood vessel problems. So we've been using this as a means of trying to pick people in that flat part of the curve who may be showing an early signal of running into problems and focusing in on that particular group. So the STOP HF trial was to take people with risk factors for heart disease and add in to their routine care this natriuretic peptide blood test. And the great thing about it, another added benefit of the trial, and I think one that appeals probably to the minister's own strategy and the government's own strategy of trying to bring care into the community, is this trial was bedded down not in an ivory tower scientific institution, UCD or Vincent's Hospital. It was bedded down in the patient's primary care practices. And we linked in with multiple practices, and again, you may recognize your own area here, all the way down to Gorey and the mothership, the hospital center was St. Vincent's. And, and again, it was very instructive to us because it's the first time I ever got myself involved in this type of research, how smoothly this could work. And also it gives you confidence that what you're seeing is real live results, as opposed to sometimes a criticism is made of research that if it's done in ivory towers and it's done in a very select group of people, that maybe it's not applicable as much to the routine community. So not only was the outcome of the STOP HF study important, how we ran it was very instructive, I think, as well. I'm not, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into how we designed it, but just, again, some of you may remember this. What we did is we you literally flipped a coin, and as you came through the GP door, I know it was more scientific than that, Mags, but flip a coin, and patients either went into the routine care arm of their GP or into a, an arm where their natural peptide blood test was taken, and they saw a lane or one of the other nurses who's worked with us over the time. And then if their natural peptide was a certain level, they came in, they also saw the cardiology services, and they got those tests done. And the whole point was if that BNP signal was there, they got more elaborate, intensive cardiovascular workup. And this is the only results slide I'm going to show. And really, you don't need to worry about the, the, the detail of it. It's just that one graph is twice as tall as another. And that's really what I see when I look at this. And on the left, you see the number of events and what I mean by events are people requiring hospitalization for a heart or blood vessel related problem. In other words, a heart rhythm disorder, a heart attack, a stroke, an episode of heart failure. They were the majority events. They were twice as common in the people that didn't have the BNP assisted care. This type of difference between two arms of a clinical trial is a very clear evident difference of impact. So there was no doubt about it when we saw this, that we had to actually abort any further enrollment and bring this from research into service. I'm going to finish up now just by showing, when we went and presented this in the States, you know, there was the occasional clap in the back, but the course is a cynic. And it's, a, it's important that the Dardis cynics are saying this was done in one little region, in one little country off the west coast of Europe. Does it actually have any meaning elsewhere? So at any time you get original research, it has to be tested elsewhere. And from our perspective, we were no longer comfortable running it as a research project because of the strength of the result. So two important observations that have come on since the last meeting. One is this, and again, don't read the detail. It's a nice name of a trial. We had Stop HF. I think it's probably nice. But there, there was another trial from Germany, Pontiac, which did basically the same thing as we did, and was published about two months ago in a very prominent journal. The only thing different between the Pontiac trial and ours is they focused entirely on diabetics. We had diabetics within our population. The Pontiac 
fo uh, focused entirely on the diabetic population and showed the exact same result. So again, that gives us comfort as the people that ran the Stop HF that of a group that we've never liaised with, who weren't even aware of our existence probably, did a similar study in Germany and came up with the same result. And interestingly, from the point of view of people in this audience, predominantly, well, exclusively in diabetics, gives us reassurance that this is a real, meaningful result. And to the credit of the HSC and the Heartbeat Trust and the other supporters of the Heartbeat Trust, which are the European <coughs> Commission, we have now extended the work from the south, from the east coast, from the, from the population I showed you on the map, into a Midland population, and again, focusing predominantly on the Midland population of diabetics, because we truly believe this is an important um, message now to get out on a national basis. Thank you very much, and uh, it's fantastic to get an opportunity to talk to a group of this size. I mean, it really is, um, and it's really good to have the Minister uh, from the Department of Health in attendance and supporting us like this. Um, so I'm going to talk for about maybe 10 minutes, so just tell me after I've gone 10 minutes. And Mark's duty. Okay, Mark, tell me when I've gone 10 minutes so I don't go over it. And uh, we'll have time for questions about uh, diabetes after. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about weight management and, and the, some of the issues uh, that I think we all need to take out of this room uh, that are relevant to uh, our families um, and that when politicians are knocking on the door, you make it an issue for the next uh, election. Okay, because it's very hard for a politician to look beyond the term of office. And they will score points uh, in elections. Uh, health is a 20 year program. And we have to get that uh, through to the politicians. That's what we want for our kids and our nieces and our nephews and so on. Obesity is like no other epidemic society has ever faced. It's come along disguised as progress and we've woken up and we suddenly realise it causes everything, all the diseases, and makes all the diseases it causes worse. 36,000 people a year die in Ireland. 6,000 of those deaths are related to uh, overweight or obesity and about 80% of those <coughs> are preventable. You have to add suicide and road traffic accidents together and multiply by eight to get the same problem. And from my point of view, managing obesity, that top line is extreme obesity, right? So population obesity has doubled over the last 30 years. But severe obesity that we're looking after out in Lockdownstown has gone up 1,200%. Mad. Explosion. We don't recognise obesity as healthcare professionals. This is the body mass index of 40, which is where grade 3 severe obesity begins. On the far side is the body mass index of 50. You ask a healthcare professional to guess, and they're just beginning to recognise obesity when it's already at the extreme end. And the minister mentioned this. These are all the determinants of obesity and Ken referred to it, an impossible graph, you'd say. Oh, we can't do anything about it. But actually, it breaks down into seven groups of areas, and surprise, surprise, three of them are about the individual, and four of them are about society. So it's, is it the individual, is it the society? It's both. We need to take some personal responsibility, but we need to get society in order as well. This is a slide our physio took, a picture our physio took of a cycle lane. <laughs> it's not funny, you know, that's the problem. This is a problem. Pedaling, 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 advertising, advertising, advertising. Uh, for that top shelf foods. This here in particular, uh, the Gooch, Paul O'Connell, uh, telling our kids that they need to have 
a bottle of Lucasade Sport going out on the pitch. Uh, you know, that should, for kids under the age of 16, just be illegal. Uh, they don't make any difference to performance. But if a five-year-old or a seven-year-old sees the Gooch or uh, Robbie, Robbie Keane, they'll think you have to have it. Coca-Cola Europe came to visit me a few weeks ago to tell me what they were doing about childhood obesity. I thought, okay, be interesting. Uh, and the first thing they said to me is, uh, well, the first thing we're doing is we're not advertising to children under the age of 16. We've stopped all advertising or promotion. And I said, wow, because my kids are going in and getting the name on bottle. The hunter gatherer has turned into the person who runs into the supermarket to look for the name of the bottle. And they said, no, 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 no. We're not advertising or promoting to anyone under 16. Uh, this is not advertising. This is brand management. <laughs> now, I don't often want to storm out of meetings, and I didn't, but I was very close, because that's the degree of cynicism we're up against. The industry cannot be expected to cooperate with getting out of this pickle. Uh, we now live in an environment, you know, when I was growing up, going into the petrol station was, roll the window down, 20 euro out, and 20 pounds as it was then, you often didn't go in. Now every little vice that you could think of, uh, alcohol, even alcohol, you know, a new range of Bordeaux wines, I've dealt with the ice cream, uh, I've dealt with the lotto, and then they introduce a new range of Bordeaux wines. So the only thing that's missing here is the kind of text flirt to 97199 that's on the television screens at the weekend, <coughs> you know? So, uh, and they even do this, they combine, which doesn't show very well, but you know, you go in and they have these offers on the counter, uh, a Coke and a Mars bar for uh, a euro, and you might win a thousand pounds. So they combine the gambling and eating and for a lot of our patients, that's hard to resist. This was sent up to me by one of my gang from Carlo, where they now have uh, parking spaces reserved for women who are pregnant right outside the door of McDonald's. Uh, and it's not good. And you know, we have five-legged Kit Kats and we have sports sweets and uh, it's, it's awful. Einstein said this, I fear for the day when technology overlaps with humanity. And his second half of the line was, the world will only have a generation of idiots. Ooh, that's a bit harsh, I thought. But we now have technology interfacing with humanity, uh, changing how we interact completely. Uh, we bought our first mobile phone in 1995, and about three weeks later, we realized we needed a second one to make it work. Uh, and, and that was, and, you know, 20 years later, less than, we're trying to stop our 10-year-old getting a mobile phone. Uh, it's, it's a very different environment. This is a picture of Minister White when he was playing on the left here. Uh, when you... You know, play was intuitive, you were allowed to fall, you were allowed to have the odd knock or bruise. Uh, the kids on the other side, there's no less intent, there's no less interest, there's no less enjoyment, but there is no physical activity. Whoops. Uh, there we are. This is really important. Sedentary time, and this is lack of physical activity destroys the good condition of every human being, while movement and methodical physical exercise save and preserve it. Does anyone know who said that? Um, Plato. Okay. So that goes back a long way. And I presented this to the final meds in, in UCD last, about six months ago, and one of the final meds came down to me at the end of it and said, God, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, and, and he should know, because he was really fit. And I was looking at him going, you know, <laughs> where, where, where is he coming from? And he said, didn't he captain Brazil in 1970? <laughs> <laughs> and I 
was about to say to him, I was about to say something about Socrates, and I didn't think he was captain. And then I said, I thought back to what Einstein said, and I said, okay, I'll leave it. <laughs> but I went to the American Diabetes Association last year, my first ever time there. Whole meeting was given over to preventing diabetes through physical activity. The whole meeting. And this doesn't show very well, but you could not find people on the stairs. They were using the escalator all the time. This was a conference of healthcare professionals going to symposia about exercise in preventing diabetes, and the escalators were going all the time. And I asked the president of the ADA, would you turn them off for one day of the five days as a symbol that we mean business? And he kind of looked at me and said, well, it's not that easy and it's all about choice. Physical activity is really important uh, in preventing diabetes, in managing diabetes when you have it, and in protecting your heart. And there's two types of exercise. And the next slide a physiologist gave to me from Birmingham, an exercise physiologist, and it explains the difference between uh, endurance exercise and resistance exercise. And they're both important. Um, and we have... And I don't want anyone to take on these shapes now, you know. Uh, you know <laughs> but the guy on the left is a bodybuilding world champion, Guy Cutler, from a few years ago. He does resistance exercise to the point of exhaustion every day. And then Lance Armstrong does endurance exercise, the walking, the swimming, the, the running, in his case, cycling. They've both been accused of, or convicted of drug and performance enhancing drugs. Uh, and you need to do a little bit of resistance. Uh, you know, the lifting up of the uh, water bottles or the cans of peas uh, is really important for a little bit of resistance, but small amounts of it. Uh, the main one for managing weight and, and helping with diabetes is the walking uh, and the walking or the swimming. Uh, and that's really, really important. Um, so, I think, you know, in terms of the healthy eating, how much you need depends on your size, your age. Uh, men need a little bit more than women. Uh, after the age of 50, the amount we need to eat comes down quite, quite a lot, but most of us kind of keep going at the same level. And then your physical activity level is really important. Um, I might just finish with one little exercise rather than go through this. Um, can I do that? Finish with a little exercise. Can I ask everyone to stand up for a second or for a few minutes? And I want you to think back to yesterday. And I want you to think about the fruit and veg that you ate yesterday. So how many portions of fruit and veg are you meant to have in a day? Five. Five, okay. Uh, and I've done this exercise a couple of times recently and it's been interesting. Uh, so think back to yesterday and I want everyone who had just one piece of fruit or veg, just one piece of fruit or veg to sit down. I now want everyone who had two, just two pieces of fruit or veg to sit down. Now I want everyone who had just three pieces of fruit or veg to sit down. <laughs> people achieving the five. Uh, I did this in St. Pat's in John Condra to sixth class two weeks ago. It was exactly the same exercise and there were six kids left standing when I said five or more. And the teachers got a bit cross, it's like come on you can't have more than more. And they said, but Mr. never said none. <laughs> so, uh, 
uh, we have to prevent obesity because once the weight goes on, it's really hard to get it off, we all know that. The financial burden is massive. I mean, the Chinese are running petrified of the obesity problem. Uh, they, they cannot future-proof their healthcare budget. They are petrified. And they're better, they're well off, pretty well off. The health burden is mental, dental, physical, and the financial cost uh, is massive. So it's preventable, uh, but it's personal and environment, not one or the other. Uh, it does switch off your immune system, which we now know causes all these problems and actually makes you a bit bigger. All of us have to be clear on our message about healthy eating and physical activity to our patients, to our families. Uh, and when you're talking to the politicians and when you're talking to relatives, just make it clear that for our kids in particular, things like sports drinks and liquid calories and top shelf foods frequently is actually causing them as much harm long term as allowing them to smoke. And we have no problem not allowing our kids to smoke. So thank you very much. A wonderful uh, video on YouTube for any of you who are interested in YouTube called 23 and a half hours. And what it does is emphasize how good we are, and I'm talking about myself here, at making excuses for not finding a half an hour every day to be active because we find uh, 23 and a half hours in the rest of the day to do all of the other things that we need to do. And exercise is so key and important. Professor O'Shea said that uh, health and healthcare is a long-term project. It's also a community-based project. And I think that, unfortunately, while there's so much uh, focus on hospital care and so much concern about hospital care, I think as a society now, we're, we're waking up to the concept that actually care needs to be delivered closer to where we live, closer to where we want to be, which is in our homes, in our communities, and not in hospitals. And so it's with great pleasure that I invite Dr. Joe Gallagher, a GP from Gorey, to talk about Stop HF, what it means for general practice, uh, and also maybe what the future might hold for the project. So when the uh, Stop HF project was first presented in the United States, um, it was described as a first-to-type study. Now, obviously, there's been huge numbers of, of trials carried out around the world. And uh, tonight, I hope to give you the, uh, a sense of why, why it was seen as being a first-to-type study. Um, and to that, we really have to go back. There's a lot of going back millennia. I'm only going back a couple of hundred years to how our modern healthcare system has developed. And this hospital in Berlin is widely regarded as being the first modern hospital. The Charité is, was founded in 1709 in Berlin, and it brought together specialists. Uh, for the first time, doctors and nurses worked in particular wards with, which dealt with particular conditions. And it led to a dramatic improvement in healthcare, which heretofore had been provided in communities, or in the home, or in small hospitals, where everyone did a bit of everything. And uh, at that time, illness was obviously a very different type, uh, or a very different type of illness that were prevalent. It was mostly infectious diseases, pneumonias, dysentery, trauma, fractures, and surgical problems. And this type of healthcare was really well suited for this and led to vastly improved outcomes. As we've heard from the other speakers, um, things have changed dramatically in, in that time. We now see chronic illness as being the major type of illness that we see. And with that, we need to change how healthcare is delivered, because that's sort of acute, episodic care, where you go into a hospital and someone sees you, and then you go back out again, and then you go back in again when you have another problem, really isn't suited to chronic illness, because people live with chronic illnesses now for most of their lives, and they need to learn how to manage it themselves, and often they know better how to manage it. They're more aware of when changes are happening, when things aren't suiting them. And so we need to change care to a more prolonged uh, care, try and base it near the community and near the pe people's homes, and also involve people themselves with it. <coughs> we also need to stop treating everyone the same. You know, if you look at any guidelines that we have at the moment for healthcare, they just say this is how you treat someone with diabetes, this is how you treat someone with heart failure. They don't really tell you how to treat someone who has diabetes and heart failure and maybe COPD and arthritis. And the, when the American Diabetic Association launched their guidelines this year, the chair so that there's an increasing recognition that the evidence derived from population-based studies really needs to be tailored to the individual patient. And that's one of the big challenges that we face. As we've managed to mention before, we need to look at team-based care. So no one individual is now going to manage 
people's care. We need not only doctors and nurses, we need podiatrists, ophthalmologists, opticians involved, the whole team in how to manage it. And the most important person is the person in the driving seat, which really should be the patient themselves, because they know what they need, know what they want, but they need guidance and need someone to help guide them towards where, where they need to go. The challenge of moving healthcare into the community has heretofore always been limited by the technology that's required. This is the, one of the first ECG machines, the one that does the tracing on the heart that many of you have had as part of the project. As you can see, it wouldn't be that easy to do, and uh, I hope no one had to do it as part of the project. <laughs> now we don't want your phone. You know, you can just sit there and hold it and it'll do it for you. Before we used to send all our blood tests off to the laboratories and you know, it would take a couple of days to get back. Now, as many of you know, you can just do it with a finger prick at the end of your finger. And so this is why I think StopHF worked. It did a number of things. The BNP blood test allowed us to direct the care to the people who needed it the most. The numbers with chronic illness are so huge that you could not provide the same level of care to everyone, and neither should we. It really targeted those who are most at risk of developing complications. This team-based care involving not only the nurses and doctors, GPs in the community, other specialists, the echo technicians, a whole variety of people that were involved in it. And it was collaborative care, where information was exchanged between GP and the hospital and all different professionals that were involved, to ensure that everyone was aware of what was happening and what the goal was. I think one of the key aspects as well is that it was structured care. So we didn't just arrive in and someone decided, oh, I think I'll do this today and I might do this next week and see how we get on, and depending on who you saw. There was a definite program in place as to what was going to happen when you were seen at the visit and what would happen depending on what the results showed. And very importantly, there was this ready access to diagnostics. Because all too often what happens is that you hit a roadblock and no one can really find out what's going on or what the next best treatment is because no one can get access to diagnostics that are needed, such as the echocardiography, to uh, really define what the problem is. Moving on from that, we've tried some new initiatives. So rather than bringing people into the hospital to get all this care, I would try and do it virtually. So you go to any place, you have web-based uh, video conferencing. This is an example of a, a session between uh, Ken and Mark and ourselves down in Gorey discussing cases, which meant the patient didn't have to travel up to the hospital. We discussed them online and make a decision who really needs to be seen and who doesn't, and we can implement changes in therapy. That's how it has to be someone to travel all the way up to, to Dublin. So, in summary, we really have a huge shift in illness patterns from that sort of acute illness to a chronic illness, and our healthcare system really needs to change with this. A real fundamental part of that is involving people with illnesses in their care and making decisions around how that care is delivered. But also because of the huge numbers that are involved and the longitudinal nature of that care, we really need to target the care to those most at risk. And people may move in and out of those categories and we need to find ways of identifying who is most at risk at any particular time. And that's part of what the BNP blood test did for us. But very importantly for us all, we need to reverse that trend and really bring healthcare back out of hospitals into the community so that everyone can have care where they're most comfortable, where it's easily accessible, and where they can feel comfortable accessing that expertise and care um, that they need. So thank you very much. Thank you.